Good morning, everybody. This is uh, another colloquia, uh, colloquium, sorry, by the Instituto de Astrofisica Andalusia under the Severo Ochoa program. And today we will have the talk by Dr. Alicia Verde from ICREA Barcelona. And she will talk about precision cosmolo cosmology. In uh, Dr. Verde will be properly introduced by uh, Isabel Marquez, our scientific director. Isabel, please. Hello, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for attending this uh, new uh, Severo Ochoa colloquium, web colloquium, since we, we are still online. And uh, first of all, I have to thank you all for being here and also to thank uh, Vizia Verde for accepting our invitation. It's a pleasure for us to, to have her here. And um, I take the opportunity to extend the invitation to an in-person one for the future when possible. We all hope that it'll be soon. Uh, Lizia Verde is an Italian cosmologist and theoretical physicist, and currently uh, she is a professor of physics and, astro and astronomy at the University of uh, Barcelona. She received a Laurea degree in, in 1996 from the University of uh, Padova, and then a PhD in 2000 from the University of Edinburgh. She did a postdoctoral studies at Princeton University and joined the faculty of the University of Pennsylvania in 2003. Uh, from uh, September 2007, uh, uh, Professor Verde is an ICREA professor at, at the ECQ, the Institute of Ciencias del Cosmos of the University of uh, Barcelona. And she was a professor at the University of Oslo during the period 2013 uh, She's been editor uh, of the Physics of the Dark Universe uh, Journal and is uh, currently deputy scientific director of the Journal of Cosmology and Astroparticle Physics. Her research interests include large-scale structure, dark energy inflation, and the cosmolo, uh, cosmic microwave uh, background. She is uh, mainly known primarily for her work on large-scale structure, analysis of the WMAP data, and development of rigorous statistical tools to analyze surface of the universe. Not only she is a highly cited author, but uh, she's uh, also known for all her amazing work. Uh, for which uh, she has deserved several very prestigious uh, prizes, like the Amelia Earthhead Award from the Santa International Foundation, the Gruber Prize in Cosmology in 2012, the National Research Award of Catalonia, or, or the Brickroth Prize in Fundamental Physics in 2018, as part of the WMAP team. And uh, uh, very recently this year, she has been awarded uh, with a Gelma first uh, price on, on basic uh, research. Today, as you know, she will give her web lock title position cosmology. Now what? So uh, thanks again, uh, Lizia, for being here. And now the, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for the in-person invitation. Once all of this, it's, uh, it's gone. It's, it's done. We'll uh, um, I will be very happy to actually meet all of you uh, in person and thank you for this uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, so yes, the opportunity to tell you a little bit about uh, what I do and the interest of uh, my research group in Barcelona. So I do cosmology, which is the study of the origin, composition and evolution of the whole universe. And cosmology underwent a deep transformation over the past 20 years or so, and went from an order of magnitude science to precision science. Now we have precision cosmology, and now we have to think, you know, what, what do you do next? Uh, so uh, we all uh, are uh, uh, familiar with uh, uh, the extremely successful uh, standard cosmological model, uh, which is the famous or infamous uh, Lambda CDM model. Oops. Um, okay. Um, so we are here uh, looking at the universe back, uh, back far away and back into the past until we see uh, the earliest light that we can see, the surface of last scattering, also called the cosmic microwave background. And the model we have described very well of our, all our observations uh, as far as we can see. Uh, so it hangs all together with just six number, as uh, Sir Martin Rees says. Uh, we have here the famous or infamous cosmic pi of the composition of the universe, and uh, uh, the just the six number are the cosmological parameters that have been the name of the game of cosmology over the past 20 years. 
uh, density of cold dark matter, uh, matter density of baryon, the current expansion rate of the universe, a parameter that says when the first star switch on, the amplitude of the primordial perturbation, and assuming that the primordial perturbation have uh, are described by a, a power spectra that is a power law, it's uh, a spectral law. Of course, so you may be familiar with a different parameterization, for example, lambda, which is, or omega lambda, which is the uh, density of dark energy or the age of the universe, but you know, these are not independent. One needs to swap one of the previous parameters for one of those. So it's not just uh, that this, this plot come from uh, the latest Planck result, but this is, uh, uh, this cosmic pi has been known since the early year 2000. And this is actually a slide from uh, after the W map result. And I was saying exactly the same. The, lambda, the, the precision cosmology, we have a lambda CDM model, it's the standard cosmological model. Six numbers describe the universe composition and evolution. There are some numbers that describe the homogeneous background, and there are some other numbers that describe the perturbation. But this leaves some question, big question open. What is lambda? What is called dark matter? And what are the origin of the primordial perturbations? Um, so in the past 20 years, cosmology has made the transition to precision cosmology has moved from a data starved science to a data driven science. And I will give you even visually some impressions of, uh, of uh, how that uh, looks like. And uh, as a standard cosmological model, uh, which describe, uh, which only few parameters describe origin, composition, and evolution of the universe. But there is a big difference between modeling and understanding. And this implies challenges and opportunities. First, never mind that the model is weird because most of what is there, it's dark, which means that we haven't really directly seen or touched it and we don't really know what it is. So on top of that, cosmology is special. It's a special science because despite what we sell to the funding agency, we can't make experiment. We can only make observations. And basically, we have to use the entire universe as a detector, but the detector is given and we can't tinker with it. And this is not my idea to describe cosmology this way. That's, idea. That's such a good idea, only could come from Jim Peebles. So this has driven a massive experimental effort, which is observe as much as possible of the universe, if you want to make the detector as big as possible to be as precise as possible. And despite this effort, the Lambda CDM model, which was shaped in the late 90s, has survived unscathed an avalanche of data. So this is the picture of the cosmic microwave background through the age as seen by different instruments. So here is the COBE map from 1992, actually it was published in 1994, but uh, they got the map in 1992. At that time, the cosmic microwave background was called the primordial fireball, the echo of the Big Bang. Uh, then 2003, that's how W map saw the same sky. And then a decade later, Planck. And the last bit of this also included the polarization because this light from the earliest universe is actually polarized and the polarization add a lot of useful information to it. And then from the year 2000, and so this change name is called the surface of last scattering or the epoch of recombination for friend is a cosmic microwave background or CMB. So this has been crucial and extremely useful uh, to understand the cosmology and understand the universe composition, structure, and evolution. How is that? Uh, the universe back then was made of a very hot and dense gas. So it was emitting radiation. This is the radiation we see when we look at the CMB. The CMB is uniform, but with tiny, the contrast is about one part in 10 to the five. Density and temperature ripples. And as you know, ripples in a gas are basically sound waves. So the physics that describe this perturbation that we see in the, in the temperature is the same physics that can describe sound waves. So we are seeing sound when we look at that, we see a snapshot of the photon baryon fluid at the last scattering surface. And this has been called a cosmic symphony. So these tiny fluctuations 
both quantitative, qualitatively and quantitatively give rise to galaxies. They evolve under gravity over the 13.8 billion year of evolution of the universe and give rise to the galaxy that we see today. So in analogy to what the Fermi was saying of the first particle accelerator, he was saying it's like taking two grand pianos, mashing them together and try to figure out how the grand piano is built. Here, what we, we do, we try to listen to the sound and figure out how the instrument is made. So the instrument is the entire universe and the sound are, are these sound waves. Now you can ask me who is playing the instrument and I'm gonna leave that question. I mean, you can ask me that question later because that's a, that's a big deal. So the CNB has been extremely useful to study cosmology, as I say, is snapshot of the photon baryon fluid a combination of the LAT scattering about 300,000 years after the Big Bang, and it's a unique window into the early universe. Now the temperature and polarization and isotropy has been scanned with high precision by Planck, a, this is a satellite, at L2, and then ground-based experiment, the latest version of them as A-ACT, SPT, Advanced ACT, at polarization, etc. And uh, this uh, picture is taken from the Planck collaboration. It's just to how exquisite the data points are. These are power spectrum of the temperature, temperature polarization, cross correlation, and polarization, and also lensing with from Planck and Planck with also uh, ground based experiment. So uh, on the side of uh, galaxy survey and large scale structures, the Landa CDM has also survived unscathed an avalanche of data. This was the state of the art in the late 90s, the CFA yeah. strip, vale. each point yeah, is a galaxy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, this is uh, yeah. the, the slow and digital sky no, survey no, no, no. map of the now, this is not the state of the art yet. I will show you the state of the art in a moment. But this original uh, survey would fit in a little corner here, yet the same model uh, survived and skated this avalanche of data. So this has brought somebody to actually say, well, maybe we live in a maximally boring universe. But I would argue that boring is good. So before I argue that, let's uh, say that cosmology has a mixed blessing. So there is a curse, which is we only have an observable universe. Of this observable universe, we can only make observations and not experiment. And therefore, we mostly fit model that is constrained numerical value of parameter to the observation. And therefore, almost any statement end up being model dependent. I say almost because there's some room for exploration there. Uh, there is also gastrophysics and nonlinearity that gets in the way. Now, gastrophysics is not a typo, it means complex astrophysics that is poorly understood and hard to model. Uh, the cosmic microwave background shows us the universe when it was extremely simple, everything was linear, is a well understood linear physics. But at the late time, the universe becomes highly nonlinear, and that's much uh, more difficult to model. But this is also a blessing because we can observe all there is to see. And this brings me to the idea that uh, we can uh, come up with the ultimate survey because once you've observed all there is to see, there's no point in repeating the experiment. And we almost do, which open the future to actually plan for ultimate survey survey that observe all there is to see and extract as much possible information that it, it's accessible to us. And I would say that the future is here because the Planck mission has produced a map of the temperature of the cosmic microwave background, which is our ultimate experiment. What I say is that the information content of the primary temperature fluctuation of the cosmic microwave background has been saturated. But this doesn't mean that is the end of the road for cosmic microwave background studies. There is the polarization that is very important. And I say primary temperature perturbation. There is also secondary effect, which are also uh, something to be explored. But this gives you a flavor that we do have an ultimate experiment. So I say primary CMB temperature fluctuation content has been saturated in order to actually make an ultimate experiment for polarization or secondary effect, they require a huge um, observational and um, uh, instrumental effort. So the near future is in large scale structure. And 
uh, and a longer time scale, of course, is the CMB polarization. So larger scale structure is just this study of the statistical property of clustering of galaxies. And uh, this has also moved the field and pushed the field in this direction. I take this uh, plot from Dave Schlegel that shows that there is a sort of uh, uh, scaling more slow also for galaxy Rashi survey. This is the year and this is the log of the number of galaxies. And basically galaxy Rashi survey increase of about a factor of 10 every 10 years. And if we extrapolate, all linear modes will be mapped by 2043, and all detectable galaxies will be mapped by 2061. Of course, this is an extrapolation, but I want to show you that the DESI survey, I'm involved with DESI, my group is involved, and I know people from uh, your institution are also involved, sits here. And the three nights of this basically are equivalent to the entire two degree field galaxy Rashi survey, which ran for five years. I did my PhD thesis on this data and uh, was, was finished in 2003. So that gives you an idea how fast the thing actually evolved. Um, so uh, to give you another flavor of how spectroscopic galaxy survey look, um, the latest result came out in January by the uh, EBOS collaboration, and before there was the BOS DR12, and the next frontier is DESI, who is already taking data. And uh, even visually, you can see this is how the EBOS uh, density of object looks like, and this is how the BOS density of uh, galaxy looks like in just you know one little uh, uh, chunk of the sky. And this is uh, over, you know, from 2008 to 2016. Okay, so what uh, is interesting in uh, from these surveys? And I don't understand where this is going. Okay, so this survey, uh, starting from around 2005 onward, has been. Uh, extremely useful and most of their statistical power has been in what are called uh, baryon acoustic oscillation or for friends and for being fast the BAO. So uh, in the cosmic microwave background, we were able to learn a lot about the universe and about cosmology because of this physics of the baryons coupled to the, uh, or the photons coupled to the baryons and uh, uh, the sound waves in the early universe. And uh, the physics of the early universe gives us a, a, standard, a standard ruler, which is the sound horizon uh, at the coupling, which is what gives the famous first peak in, uh, in uh, the power spectrum of the temperature of the cosmic microwave background. So the same wiggles that we saw in the power spectrum of the cosmic microwave background can also, are also in print in the dark matter distribution. As baryons are one sixth of the dark matter, the baryonic oscillation that gave rise to the temperature signal in the CMB leaves some imprint in the dark matter distribution and gravity is a coupling. And then when galaxies form on this dark matter scaffolding, they carry this, uh, this signature. Uh, so uh, to see it in another way, the cosmic microwave background map puts the seeds of galaxy. The Planck collaboration did a wonderful job of actually stacking uh, the cold spot and showing that indeed you can see uh, the standard ruler, the baryon oscillation in there in the same way as then it will be visualized in the large scale structure. And uh, it's like throwing stones in a pond or, or rain uh, to create a series of, of uh, ripples that go out from the center. And the idea is that uh, the imprint of this ripple is also seen in the largest scale structure distribution. So this gives us a standard ruler in 3D. You should visualize it more as a standard bubble, but OK. And uh, the, the effect as one observe galaxies at the late time, uh, and instead of measuring distances, measured redshift, it's a classic Alkopachinsky effect. But the key, the key things is that there is a standard uh, ruler, and uh, uh, the physics in the early universe are the one that propagate until radiation and matter decouple. 
This defined the standard ruler. It's a ski observable, is useful for measuring the geometry of the universe. Early uh, universe physics, which is extremely well known, sets it. And the cosmic maker background observation and early universe physics in the standard lambda CDM model constrain the standard ruler length to 0.2%. So we are uh, we're below percent precision. Uh, there is a lot of more physical information from larger scale structure. I uh, stole this figure from uh, Will Percival. Uh, the clustering can uh, uh, help us address questions like what are the constituents of matter? What is the physics of inflation? Before, when I say it, who actually is sounding the instrument? The answer is for uh, physicists is inflation. Um, the standard ruler tell us about expansion history of the universe and give us an insight into dark energy. There's more information there with Reich space distortion, which uh, I go into a little bit more detail in a moment, right? Because we observe redshift, we don't observe distances, and redshift will be a perfect distance indicator if the universe wasn't clumpy. But the universe is clumpy, and therefore, galaxies tend to fall into the potential well of uh, dark matter created by the dark matter and that distorts uh, this uh, mapping but uh, one man trash is another man treasure obviously this distortion include a lot of useful information about gravity and about how much dark matter there is in the universe on large scale there are information about homogeneity and uh, non gaussianity that is uh, something about the mechanism that generated the primordial perturbation and for each of these dots, uh, there's a, a wealth of information in the form of a spectra uh, of the galaxy. And this gives known cosmological information about galaxy formation, which may be the key to ensure robustness of everything else that is up here and it's of interest to cosmologists. So I should also say that uh, for uh, basically the same price in terms of fiber put on the focal plane of the telescope, uh, one can also extract information from the Lyman Alpha Forest, from the spectra of, from the quasar spectra and the absorption on the quasar spectra from the uh, intergalactic uh, medium along the line of sight of the quasar. And I'll just put this slide here because at, at some point later, I would say this constraint comes from the clustering of the Lyman Alpha Forest. Um, so we have this concordant cosmology, and with, with this, we, and with all this data set, we can now do precision tests of fundamental physics with cosmological data. So things like nature of dark matter, dark energy, nature of gravity, physics of the early universe, neutrino masses, and so on and so forth. So I'm gonna take the example of neutrino masses because I think it's a, a very nice example of how cosmology connects with fundamental physics and I can give you very complementary information to uh, physics experiment. So in this sense, boring is good. We can do that because we have a standard model that provides such a good description of all the data. Of course, there are challenges. As the statistical error shrink, the systematic error must be kept under exquisite control, and there is no systematic way to address systematic errors. So I like to zoom in in the fresco that I showed you before of the concordance cosmology. Uh, in this fresco here, all nice as concordance in here, but if you look below at the bottom, then there is this detail which reminds me of the systematic error which we must move well beyond the modeling of spherical cows and really you know, get into the nitty gritty detail of actually understand all this nonlinear astrophysics as much as possible to ensure robustness of big claim that cosmology can do about say dark energy or neutrino masses. So let's come to neutrinos. Uh, the universe is pervaded by the cosmic neutrino background, which is a relic of the Big Bang, similar to the cosmic microwave background, except that the cosmic neutrino background decoupled from matter two seconds after the Big Bang, not 380,000 years after the Big Bang. So at the coupling, neutrino have still relativistics and they have large velocity dispersion. So uh, if we are here and we put up our thumb, we know that there are uh, 60, 60 billion uh, neutrinos per second passing through our thumb, but they come from the sun. Uh, 
And in comparison with uh, uh, 100 uh, neutrino per cubic centimeter, which are in the cosmic neutrino background. However, the sun is one, it's localized here, and, but the universe is very big. So even if there is a much lower density for the cosmic neutrino background, they matter much more than the one from the sun at the cosmological level. So uh, what particle physics experiment can tell us about uh, uh, the absolute uh, neutrino mass? So this is an ambitious terrestrial experiment. This is the Catherine experiment, as it was being uh, uh, moved to uh, the final location of, uh, of the lab. And uh, uh, so in this plot, I show the mass of the lightest neutrino versus the sum of the masses. And this line here are what neutrino oscillation tell us. Neutrino oscillation can tell us about uh, the square mass differences, but not a lot about the absolute neutrino mass or the sum of the neutrino masses. That experiment, Catherine Kahn, and, but the detection versus 90% limit will hit here at the order of, you know, just below uh, one EV. These are the two famous or infamous hierarchy, the inverted hierarchy and the normal hierarchy given by the observation. So what is cosmology in this landscape? So what, what, what's the physical effect for cosmology? If neutrinos have a total mass above one EV, they become non relativistic before recombination, and then their effect can be seen immediately in the primary cosmic microwave background uh, fluctuations. For total mass below one EV, they become non relativistic after recombination, so they can still alter matter radiation equality, but this effect can be cancelled by degeneracy with other cosmological parameters. So the, the CMB starts losing statistical power to tell us something about. Uh, so if we look after recombination, there's another effect that becomes important that is the finite neutrino masses, since neutrinos are hot and they tend to run out of the potential wells, the matter potential well, if they have mass, they carry that mass with them. And so they suppress the matter power spectrum on scales smaller than their free streaming length. So depending on which cosmological parameters one keep fixed, this suppresses the matter power spectrum and suppresses the matter power spectrum proportionally to the mass of the neutrino. And for a 1 EV on small scale, this is a, a, a huge suppression, a 50% suppression. And, and, and 0.3 EV, it's a 15% you know, suppression. This is huge. This is a huge effect. So one should be able to see it, especially in an epoch of a precision cosmology. The thing comes that, uh, however, one, uh, when one constrains, cosmology doesn't constrain just neutrino mass, constrain all the parameters of the model. So if one moves along the parameter degeneracy given to, to us from the cosmic microwave background, then one needs to keep fixed the parameter that the, that the, the CMB constrains and the net effect on the larger scale structure is much smaller. But at the end of the day, there is information there, it's just a question of extracting. So this is what the collab several collaborations have done, uh, constrained from the CMB, both primary and secondary, adding uh, the information about baryon acoustic oscillation, and then also adding information about large scale structure, including the clustering of the Lyman Alpha Forest. And it turns out that if we only look at the cosmic microwave background, primary and secondary, that's why the cosmic microwave background go well before uh, just uh, one EV. One exclude all this region. If one add baryon acoustic oscillation, one gets down here. And if one add the larger scale structure alignment alpha forest, one ends up down here. So you see an order of magnitude almost below what a direct experiment can do. This is of course an indirect and model dependent constraint, but it's an order of magnitude. Uh, and so the implications are, well, if we believe the strongest cosmological constraint, then the inverted hierarchy is uh, under pressure. So cosmology is key to determine neutrino masses. For the pessimist, the inverted hierarchy is under pressure, but for the optimist, then if 
its inverted hierarchy, then a measurement of the neutrino mass from cosmology just around the corner. So again, this is an example of how boring is good. It goes deeper than that, I think. I like this quote of Daniel Kahneman about theories. He says, we can't live in a state of perpetual doubt, so we make up the best story possible and we live as if the story were true. And in cosmology, we have a lot of stories. We have the GR, Big Bang, choice of metric, nucleosynthesis, all the components of the model at the end of the day are a little bit like stories, or they make up this story. So cosmology tends to rely very heavily on model, both for what we call signal and what we call noise. Although remember that the noise for one person is signal for the other. And essentially, we know all models are wrong, but, uh, but some are useful. So this is in the back of my mind and by extension also in the, mark, in the back of my research group mind is how do you test the model? And uh, can you do without? And uh, you can't do completely without the model exactly because we don't make experiment, we make observations, but maybe we can do without aspects of the model, which sort of help ask yourself whether to trust the model. So uh, this quote from Feynman, it's very fitting. It says, the first principle uh, is that you must not fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool. So if you believe a model, you may keep fitting the data with this model. You may end up getting constraint on the parameter, but this doesn't mean that those parameters are actually physically meaningful and they mean something. So in the, in the rest of the time, I would like to give you some uh, highlight of some of the recent effort uh, in-house to actually go in this direction. And I pick two examples. One is a blinding strategy for spectroscopic surveys, which is uh, ended up in a, in a published paper, which is entitled Blind Watchers of the Sky. Uh, and I would like to highlight the effort of graduate students, Samuel Bryden and uh, postdoc uh, Hector Kidmarin, and a model independent analysis of uh, galaxy clustering, which uh, was out this summer and is, not, is, is so uh, new that is not yet, uh, yet published. And this is, I don't know what's going on here. And this is uh, us at the DESI collaboration meeting uh, trying to explain what, uh, what the blinding uh, looks like. So before I go on, I need to add another piece of information about uh, the information extracted from galaxy regime surveys. So beyond the baryon acoustic oscillation, which I say that from 2005 onward is where most of the statistical power in, in, in uh, galaxy regime survey for cosmology was, there is uh, so the, the next information content, the next quantity that has useful information content is what is called Rashi space distortion or for the friends, RST. Um, peculiar velocity are sourced by the gravitational pull from the homogeneity in the homogeneities. And, and uh, this peculiar velocity is what distorts this mapping between distance and redshift. So using the observed redshift as a proxy for the distance that introduces distortion in uh, the galaxy map. So this distortion, uh, which for somebody could be a noise, is actually a useful signal and can be used mostly to measure the growth of structure and the parameter combination that the constraints better, this, this quantity constraint better is what is called F sigma eight. Sigma eight is the amplitude of dark matter fluctuation today on a scale of eight metaparsecs. And F is the linear growth of perturbation because it's, it's velocity that one is measuring at the end of the day. So this uh, game of uh, looking at the uh, Rashi space distortion, uh, we as a community started uh, to play it in 2001. I mean, it was known from well before, it goes back from a, a paper by Nanik Kaiser in the, in the very early 90s. But this is the first plot that I know that shows uh, the anisotropy in the otherwise statistically isotropic distribution of galaxies. 
uh, induced by Rashi space distortion. And this comes from the two degree galaxy Rashi survey in 2001. These are highly nonlinear scales. So this is interpreted as incoherent velocity dispersion in the center of high density region like cluster. And this flattening, because this is not isotropic while the universe is expected to be isotropic, is the infall into high density region. Now, fast forward 20 years, now the uh, uh, EBOS uh, uh, published this plot where they done this, these scales will fit down here into the middle. So this is looking at much, much, much larger scale. This is this line here. It's on a scale of 150 uh, megaparsec, while well, this scale is 20 megaparsecs. And at several different redshift from point below point two all the way to what 1.4. Um, so the other bits of information that you need is to discuss about blind. Uh, in particle physics, it's quite common to carry blind analysis. Blind analysis it means that somehow something is being done either to the data or to the analysis procedure so that the experimenter doesn't know what the real result is, can still analyze the data. And then at the end where all the pipeline are, uh, you know, are, we are confident with all the pipeline and everything, then one get the result get unblind. And if uh, any of you remember uh, with the gravitational wave collaborations, uh, that was around I think 2011, they did blind their data and they put some fake signal in there. They, the collaboration didn't know that this was a, a fake signal. They thought that the signal was a real signal. They let the collaboration go on all the way to even write the, the paper. At the moment of submission, they decided to unblind the data and say, sorry. So, you know, they had to wait a few more years <laughs> before actually the result was not. Uh, the blind result. In that case, this is called salting of the data. So if you want to uh, find out more about uh, blinding in cosmology, which is not as uh, widespread as uh, uh, for uh, uh, physics, there is a, a nice uh, uh, commentary in Nature by Robert McConnell Solpermutter that says, I'd result to seek the truth. Now, uh, in uh, larger scale structure, blinding so far has been done just by, you know, mm, when you plot something, don't put the labels on the plot or just rescale the line in the plot. And we saw that this was not really satisfactory. So we design a way to blind galaxy Rashi surveys at the catalog level. And I'll summarize uh, our proposal. The proposal is to act uh, only along the line of sight, so you don't mess up with the angular weights uh, and it's not easy to unblind accidentally because usually the input catalog are photometric catalog, so you could easily, if you change the position of the object, cross correlate the photometric catalog with the spectroscopic catalog and you can unblind. And the idea is to blind both the BAO and the Rashi space distortion signal at the catalog level by applying a combined two type of shift along the line of sight. One shift, which is just the classic Alko Pacinski like shift, which is a geometrical shift, which reproduces the effect on cosmology on any standard ruler, not just the baryonic acoustic oscillation. If there was any other standard ruler there, uh, embedded in the data, it will do that to the standard ruler too. And also a density dependent shift that basically behave exactly like crash space distortions, but is not generated by the universe itself, it's generated by whoever is blind in the data. These are very tiny uh, shift only along the line of sight, but they are enough to actually change the infer cosmological parameters and it's also easy to unblind a posteriori. So we tested uh, this procedure on the BOSS data where a an, an non-blind analysis has been done already. So we, sh we show how we recover the result of the standard analysis and we are now trying to adapt it uh, for this. Uh, the other 
things, which is very new, is some approach, some, some attempt to do a model independent uh, interpretation of galaxy clustering and to compare it with the model dependent interpretation of galaxy clustering, what we call shape fit. So you, um, you may know that there are two philosophies to constrain cosmology from galaxy clustering. Uh, the philosophy that I've described so far is uh, a sort of compression. All the information is compressed into the baryon acoustic oscillation signal and this Alcopachisky type test of the standard ruler and the Rashi space distortion, which at the end of the day, the information is compressing in just one number, which is in a lambda CDM model interpreted as this uh, F sigma A. Um, the signal is the angular location of the baryon acoustic oscillation, not its amplitude. And so this gives information about the expansion history, not its normalization. Uh, so only early time physics information or data then can give the lens of the standard ruler in the baryon acoustic oscillations. Um, then the other bit is the Rashi space distortions, which uh, give you this absolute. But then there is another approach and the approach will be, well, why don't you do like you do for the cosmic microwave background? You pick a model and fit uh, the data. So you pick a model and fit the anisotropic power spectrum. Then you pick another model and then you fit. So that's why cosmic microwave background results are always given in terms of in a lambda CDM, Planck tells you this, in a model where we have dark, early dark energy, Planck gives you this, in a model with a varying dark energy equation of state, Planck gives you this. But the larger scale structure don't do that because most of them first compress the data. And uh, the compression approach is said to be much more model independent because it constrains physical quantities, not parameter of the model. And then it's this physical quantity that again get interprets in terms of parameter of a model. Mm -hmm. The approach number two, which is just take model and fit, is much more com computationally expensive, obviously more model dependent, but it turns out that it gives better constraints. So there's some extra information they are in the data that the compressed approach is not capturing. So we were scratching our head a lot to try to understand where is that information buried. And so after a lot of effort, it turns out we understood that the different information content between the two approaches come mostly from the behavior of the matter transfer function turnaround that is the shape of the matter power spectrum on very large scale. Uh, back in the papers of the 19, this was called the big gamma parameter, and it was identified with the omega matter times little h. The detail of the expansion history around matter radiation equality are what determine this other sort of standard ruler. And to a much smaller extent, the amplitude of the baryon acoustic oscillation, you could have, you know, below percent or up to 2% oscillations. And um, so here it's uh, the overall shape in, uh, in, imprinted by uh, the behavior of the matter transfer function as you turn around. This is the response of the power spectrum to the change of parameters. So, uh, let's go back, a maximally boring universe, maybe so, but the question we may ask is how would a non-boring development look and play out? So in the next uh, uh, five or six minutes, let me open this uh, possible discussion. I'm not sure I have an answer for the rest of this talk, but I'm sure you will find it. So let's consider an example. I'm not saying that necessarily we have seen a non varying development or uh, you know, some crack in the model, but it's a nice historical example to see how the community would proceed if we were to find one possible indication of a crack. And I could not take anything else than the story of the Hubble constant. So these are, uh, measurement of the Hubble constant over time until 2014 or so, uh, direct measurement to the standard cosmic distance ladder, mostly calibrated on Cepheid stars, agree 
with cosmic microwave background constraint because up to here, up to the black point, we only had Planck, we only have a W map. And then when Planck comes along, then we start seeing a difference. Notice that the cosmic microwave background is always consistent with itself. The standard distance ladder is always consistent with itself, but as the error bar shrinks, then this uh, uh, two uh, different camp emerged. And then uh, since 2015, uh, the Carnegie Chicago group uh, worked on another way of uh, measuring uh, Hubble constant with the cosmic distance ladder, but not uh, relying on cephates, which is called the tip of the red giant branch. And it was only in, in uh, 2019 when the error bar became small enough to actually say, well, you know, we, we land exactly in the middle. So why do I like uh, the Hubble constant? I like the Hubble constant because the Hubble constant game, because I think it can be seen as an end-to-end -end test of uh, the model. Uh, determination from the cosmic microwave background are obviously model dependent, but they are based on very simple physics. They don't measure the Hubble constant because the Hubble constant is the expansion history of the universe today. The cosmic microwave background cannot measure that. But within a cosmological model, since you only have six parameters, the current expansion rate of the universe is one of the parameters of the model. And the error bars are tiny there. And then at the other end of the universe, one can do, which is what, for example, the shoes collaboration is doing. It's a, a, a traditional cosmic distance ladder. And it is like uh, trying to uh, 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 fit, you know, uh, to, to thread a needle from the other side of the universe, given the fact that we are taking the two ends of the history of the universe and the target that the error bars are now becoming legible. And so here, my uh, visual interpretation of uh, the cosmic di distance ladder and what the cosmic distance ladder has become uh, in the past, say, uh, 10 years. So before the cosmic distance ladder was built all the way to supernovae into the Hubble flow just to measure the, the Hubble constant. And then there was no way to go beyond. So it was hitting the supernovae and it was stopping there at the redshift around one. But what happened with the advent of this large galaxy survey is that uh, now you have uh, not only uh, a standard candle, which are type 1a supernovae, they measure relative distances because there is large uncertainty on their absolute magnitude. But we also have a standard ruler, baryon acoustic oscillation. They can measure absolute distances <clears throat> if we rely on the sound horizon at radiation drag, which we rely on this standard ruler given by the CMB. So uh, this kind of supernova needs to be calibrated on cephates and then calibrated locally to give H naught, while the baryon acoustic oscillation are calibrated in the early universe to give us uh, the expansion, the normalized expansion history of the universe. But it turns out that supernovae and baryon acoustic oscillation now overlap in redshift, and they have error bars that are small enough that they can be calibrated to one another. And so since about 2015, it became possible to do either the direct cosmic distance ladder where it's the BAO calibration that allows to go all the way to CMB, or an inverse cosmic distance ladder. So take the standard ruler from the CMB, get it to the BAO, couple with the supernova, and go back to uh, redshift zero and get H naught. And it turns out that there's no much wiggle room in the middle. We know this function history of the universe well enough that there's no much with the wiggle room in the middle. But we know good ladders need two good anchor points. And uh, the sort of uh, scissor plot I showed before seems to indicate that there's something wrong with the anchor points. So is there a problem? Now, 
uh, after a lot of debate, it turns out that most of the community will agree that yes, there is a problem, we need to look into it, the disagreement, especially with the uh, shoes collaboration determination. And depending on how you do the statistics, it's uh, above four sigma, you can get to five sigma. Of course, how much of a problem is cosmological knowledge? Even one of the most convinced uh, proposer of the fact that there was not a problem, George Estatio now agreed, there's something that we should look into. The big question is, what is the problem? And so a lot of effort has gone into that. And I'll try to cut a long story short and, uh, and, uh, and summarize very quickly. Now, of course, every experiment has their skeleton in the closet. There are systematics, but the data has been made public, the things have been reanalyzed even by independent group, and uh, only a silly systematic seems to be increasingly unlikely. Uh, it started also becoming, so the next question is, is it the problem in any specific data set? And for a while, uh, people put the blame on Planck, but it turns out since about 2019 that you can uh, uh, take CMB data and even plan completely out, just rely on uh, BBN, primordial nucleosynthesis, theory of primordial nucleosynthesis, observation of light and element abundance, and still there is a problem with, uh, with h -naught. So is it in any specific data set? Well, it's not in the CMB data. All early universe-based determination hover well below 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Many group reanalyzed shoes data. Several independent low redshift determination hover above 70, but not all. Remember, the, uh, the tip of the red giant branch does not. And so it turns out that if it's not in the data, then we may ask ourselves whether maybe the problem can be in the model, but this is, uh, this is a big issue. And so uh, since we learn that in this ladder, uh, the steps of the ladder are pretty much constrained and we only have freedom in the two anchor point, we can only play around either with early time physics or with late time physics. And so, uh, Either you mess around with the lens of the standard ruler, or you have uh, to do something later, but this later it becomes uh, extremely, uh, extremely hard. Extremely hard because we have good data and it says that the, all the, the, if you want to mess around, you have to do it very close, very nearby, but not where we have a lot of BAO data and a lot of supernovae data that tell you that the shape of the expansion history it's re pretty much around the CDN. So there have been a lot of paper working on pre-recombination solution. Now that modified the model right where we most like it. And we need a big modification. We need to decrease the sound horizon by 7% without breaking havoc in the dumping tail of the CNBN and everything else. So here are suggestions, early dark energy, change of initial condition, extra component, extra interaction, energy injection, temperature, high, high temperature recombination. Uh, despite the not being palatable because you modify the model where you most like, these are not all equivalent. So next generation data will tell you which one it is or will rule them all out. So uh, since my time is up, let me just say that if we decide that we have to look for a model uh, and it's not a question of the data or a uh, systematic that we haven't yet uncovered, then we are still looking for Cinderella. So let me put up my conclusion. The concordance vanilla lambda CDM model still rules despite the avalanche of data. I will be completely honest and say that some puzzle remain. I talk about the H0 puzzle that is a much smaller puzzle about the amplitude of fluctuation today, the famous sigma 8 one, that's the two sigma level though. There is a coordinated effort to move from precision cosmology to accurate cosmology. The field has moved well beyond spherical cows and pie in the sky, but at a 
cost of a huge effort and large collaboration and so on. Accuracy is the new precision. That's the name of the game. And being very careful about relying too much on the model, especially if with accuracy, we want to try to test the model. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Licia. I want to thank uh, for giving so nice talk in a very, very difficult topic. Sometimes it's, it's really hard to follow you. Um, so now we will open uh, some time for questions, suggestions, comments. So please uh, put your hand on and I will passage you through the Zoom. Anybody want to ask any question? Isabel Marquez. Uh, it's, um, thank you very much, first of all. It's been um, really nice to have such a good talk uh, that I really appreciate. So that, that's great. Even if I'm not sure if I've understood everything, but that's because of my ignorance, not, not because of you. So um, uh, first, congratulations. And, and then, um, since I am an um, obser observer ob or observational uh, astrophysicist, then it seems to for me to be able to conclude from your talk that no more observations are needed, <laughs> uh, okay. which is completely opposite to what we normally, I mean, we always say. So that's good. I mean, um, is it okay. true? So no, no. So uh, it depends for what. So primary uh, CMB temperature fluctuation, this, uh, the information content has been saturated, but that's not the whole story because uh, there is a secondary, there could be spectral distortion, there is definitely polarization, and already right now, there is uh, the, in the Planck constraint, half of the statistical power come from temperature and half of the statistical power come from polar polarization, and there's a lot of uh, uh, self-consistency check one can do with temperature and polarization, but to bring the polarization uh, to the next level, one will need uh, you know, a dedicated space mission with technology that we don't have in hand. In large scale structure, I'm saying that in principle, one could observe all there is to see, but we are not there yet. So uh, we, are, we are there so that we can see the imprint of this uh, early physics standard ruler uh, with uh, some good statistical uh, precision up to about redshift one but we will want to go beyond and we will want to start shrinking those error bar and this can still be done. There's still volume to actually be seen. However, if I extrapolate that more slow, it will tell you that in 2043, <laughs> all the linear mode would have been observed. But of course, one can then start doing uh, multi-tracer. One can just ask a question about galaxy formation rather than just about uh, you know, primordial cosmology, or they may be signature of primordial cosmology cosmology that we could see beyond just uh, linear modes. And there are already clear indication that there is that. So no, <laughs> we can still ask that's, for that's more telescopes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so, it's also good to show what you've delivered, right? You can yeah, show that good. you know there is a, an obvious milestone and what that milestone will give you and what will be the banks for your bucks. Good. Thank you very much, and and and, and I insist on, on asking you to to be here some at some moment. Thanks a lot. Thank you, uh, Rainer. Yes, you want. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this talk. I, I really enjoyed it. I, I stuck to it, although via Zoom there's always so much distraction around. But I stuck to it. So this is because I really, probably also because it was a fundamental talk, and I'm not from the field, so I'm happy to learn things. Um, I have two brief questions. So the first one is more like a comment for me when I look, see this uh, determination of H0 and you have uh, the Cephates up there and down there you have Planck and then in the middle you have the tip of the red giant branch. I'm an observer for me. It's like, yeah, obvious. Everything is biased. The solution is in the middle. I mean, and then you defend it that no, this is really different. So I was, how can you be so sure of that? 
so uh, what I show in that plot is just uh, the, the shoe determination, the CMB and the tip of the regime branch. There are also other type of measurement, but they okay. just okay. don't appear yeah. there. So uh, also in that single determination, it's true that they all pa a lot of the statistical power passes through the Cephades, but there is actually, there are determination that tend to bypass the Cephades, for example, the Maser distances mm -hmm. and uh, so, and uh, uh, surface riser fluctuation. So, there's a lot that goes in, in there. And, uh, and Adam Rees has even a, a prefix menu where it just says, of all this, you can pick three and you can combine them whichever way you want. <laughs> and then you see that whatever you do and pick, the number doesn't budge much. So then we really need to understand the difference between tip of the dread giant branch and the Cephade uh, calibration. So you can say there's something wrong with the Cephate, which is always a possibility. But what it turns out is that they, they all agree in relative distances. They don't agree in the overall calibration. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it all comes to actually understanding the dust in the tip of the red giant branch. That's distinction, which dust is always everywhere. But the Gaia, the third Gaia data release would be able to actually uh, clear it out. Because mm -hmm. if they can get the parallaxes to you know, uh, Omega Sen, for example, where there are both supernovae and cephates, then that's it. Okay, thanks. And my the second comment, although that may be going a bit too far because this is just leaning into my ignorance instead of hiding it. Um, could you briefly, in a very compressed uh, way, illuminate me again about the inverted mass problem of the neutrino? So it's a problem okay. of the flavor physics and, and what's inverted and what's not inverted. Ah, okay, so like... we know uh, the, the square mass differences, but we mm -hmm. don't know how they are oriented. We know there's a big one, we know there's a small one, but we don't know if you have the small one here and the big one here or the big one here and the small one here. You don't know how they are, they could be like this or they could be like that. Relative to what? I mean, the big. Uh, you don't have the overall scale, so you don't know where you put the minimum mass. Yes, but what? Where's the inversion then? I mean, I understand that you have to put in. Is the inversion the question of what flavor of neutrino comes first, has the highest mass? Is that the problem of inversion? Uh, I, mean, the mass, I understand you the have to mass, calibrate the entire yeah, mass, but yeah. where is? I don't get the, this. The mass inverted. eigenstate is not the flavor eigenstate. So the whole thing are a little bit, uh, right? So it's more technicality. But it's, it's, it's about what they the call the, Yeah, they call them one they call normal and one they call inverted. Ah, OK, OK, OK. Then I was just uh, confused by what gets inverted. But I thought, yeah, it's, it's a problem fixing the absolute mass. Thank you very much. Carlos? Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Richie. Hola. So, thank you for your talk. Just uh, one more question regarding this H naught tension. Um, uh, there were like intermediate redshifts or not. Uh, they were trying to estimate the H naught, the Hubble constant, using lenses, lensing, gravitational yes. lenses around yes. galaxy yes. clusters. And they were kind of yes. with some controversy around those yes. because they were initially agreeing with the estimate from, yeah. from Shoes, yes. but then there was some. Yeah, uh, yeah. There was some discussion about the ignorance about how mass is distributed yeah. within the lenses, and this increased the error bars, but also shifted the central values towards the the, the H naught values measured by by the BEOs. So, do you know what is the current status on on on, on, on galaxy cluster yes, lenses? Yes, because I was I was in a PhD thesis committee that presented exactly that work. <laughs> so, so yeah. basically, uh, when they do this uh, uh, time delay lensing. Uh, they need to know uh, what is the profile of the lens. And uh, these are big clusters, so they need to know that cluster profile. In the standard analysis, they assume some power law uh, or some NFW or whatever, and then they give some little freedom to this model, marginalize over the parameters of that model, and they go with it. Then they are trying to put some constraint from velocity dispersion, et cetera, but they don't have good enough data to actually really you know, make a, a drastic uh, improvement. So then they did, well, why don't we actually compare with some external data set of lenses that are actually of different type and lower redshift, but where we have a better control over the profile? These are completely different beasts, OK? Mm -hmm. And then they just say, well, then now what we find from this, we plug it into our sample. And then the error bar increase a lot. And the center changes a little bit. But it's not just this, the changes, mostly that the error bar increase a lot. 
But basically, that is the most conservative things you can ever do because you are taking, you know, a cat, you compare it with a dog, <laughs> and you are saying, well, they have four legs. So let's see what I, how I get. So it's it's a little bit of a stretch. So the bottom so, leg now then is the lens profile. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And we don't know, I mean, we cannot infer this from X-ray observations or SC observations because those clusters are massive guys that you, you know, are relatively well known. No? Yeah, but the, so that. they need the profile in, much in, not really much out. I see. Uh, and okay. so you cannot do it that way. So they want to do it with velocity dispersion. But so far, they, they have one number for the velocity dispersion. You will want the velocity dispersion as a function of the aperture, and they're not there yet. I see, I see. Thank you, teacher. Thank you, Carlos. More question or comments? Yeah. Uh, Pepa here, Rene. Rene, yeah. There is a question on the YouTube uh, chat. Uh, there is a participant who want to ask you, Lisa. Shantanu Desai say, any comments on the Dama Libra signal? The, this is an unresolved mystery for more than 20 years. Oh, okay, so is he referring uh, to uh, the um, uh, seasonal oscillation in the dark matter detection from Dama Libra, which went on for, for, for 20 years? As you know, if we have a halo, a dark matter halo, uh, the sun is going around the dark matter halo, the earth is going around the sun. So half of the year you're going with the sun. And so you have, uh, you know, a, a dark matter wind. And then the other half of the year when the earth is going back, you have a reduced dark matter. We still have a dark matter with but reduced dark matter. Width. So if you are detecting dark matter in the Dama Libra, which is this uh, crystals, super isolated, et cetera, that you should see some recoil from you know, the dark matter particle in the crystal. And you see this uh, modulation and it goes with the season, you say, hi, ah, it's dark matter. Now, uh, this has been unchallenged for 20 years. What you will want to do is either to take the same crystal and put it in Australia, where winter is summer and summer is winter. And so if there is an environmental effect, which may happen, you are underground, it rains more, it rains, who knows, right? It, it gets swap or do an independent experiment. It turns out that um, there was an experiment actually doing that. And the result came out uh, actually a few months ago and they didn't see anything. So with a similar crystal. Okay. okay. There is another question by Nacho Sevilla. Nacho, go ahead. Hi, Lisa. Um, great talk, very insightful. Thanks very much. Um, I was we cannot listen to you very well, so try to speak uh, oh, okay. loud. Is that better now? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're just uh, congratulating Lisa for a very insightful talk. Um, my question again, back to the H zero conundrum. Uh, do you? What is your opinion on the value of the gravitational wave measurements, especially when we have a lot of distance and redshift yeah. measurements for those? Do you think that is going to put the nail in the coffin of this issue, or is that? I mean, okay. You, you Sorry, Lisa. Can you repeat the question? Yes. Because we yes. Can so, so the question is, uh, uh, what do I think about the potential of uh, gravitational waves to uh, uh, help us understand what's going on with H0? So uh, as you know, uh, there is uh, uh, this uh, uh, event of, I don't, I, unfortunately I don't remember the phone number of uh, uh, the gravitational wave with opt optical counterpart uh, that happen close enough so that the gravitational wave were detected, the optical counterpart was found, the redshift was found, uh, that gave a measurement of the Hubble constant with uh, actually an error bar, which is uh, you know plus or minus 10, which is where the state of the art in cosmology was a decade ago, but just with a single object. So things, you know, people that are in the audience that are in gravitational wave collaboration no, no more than me, uh, 
anything that can go boom in the universe does, the moment you actually switch on the antenna and you find one, you are likely to find many more. I'm sure they are sitting on uh, a trove of gold there. Uh, if you have enough of those and forecast to say that uh, one should get many with uh, uh, of the order of tens, then the error bars on the H naught will shrink a lot. And the nice thing is that in that case, you measure the distance from uh, the gravitational wave signal. You measure the redshift from uh, the optical counterpart. So you do exactly what the Apple says it's uh, written uh, on, on the label. You don't put any cosmological model in there. I mean, you can put the modeling of the gravitational wave signal and there's some modeling in the interpretation right now, especially about the orientation. Although probably with more detectors online, the orientation will get uh, will get sorted much better. So yes, there are forecasts. They say that with a few ten, you can really make it or break it. It's a completely independent, very clear measurement. Uh, that event was pretty lucky because it was just close enough but far away enough. <laughs> And we don't know how many of those closing up, uh, you know, uh, Goldilocks kind of <laughs> uh, event are out there, but eventually, yeah. So watch that space. Thank you, Nacho. Thank you. Uh, and because uh, we've, we spent already 20 minutes of question, please. The last question or comment from the audience. There is no comment. Okay, I have one myself and I will take the opportunity. Uh, Licia, uh, 20 years ago, uh, I, there was there were a, a lot of debate uh, with the nucleosynthesis mm -hmm. element determination to support the model and all this uh, you men mentioned very mm -hmm. quick. Uh, how is the situation right now? I didn't follow that. If uh, now uh, that we can reach uh, uh, galaxies at larger redshift and we can calculate uh, helium abundance uh, much better than before, so that's, uh, do you think that uh, there is some extra work to do in that? Wait. So I think in terms of uh, helium, uh, uh, CMB constraint and uh, uh, late universe constraint, they agree, of course, you know, the CMB is uh, very precise and the late universe constraint have larger error bars, uh, but things uh, are, are getting cl much closer into agreement. Now, I think there is still a problem with lithium, but uh, yeah. I don't work on that. So that my knowledge is uh, it's limited, but there may still be a problem there. Okay. Thank you. I want to, to thank a lot for the extraordinary talk. Thank you. you, you well, we, I think that uh, we will take home many messages about uh, cosmology, especially those of us that are not cosmologists, so uh, so we have learned a lot. So I want to thank and, and again invite you to come here um, and spend more time discussing all these topics um, from uh, a person like you that uh, manage the theory and the observations. So that is, it could be a great pleasure. Thank you. I look forward yeah. to that. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very everybody. Much. Isabel, when you add, do you want to add anything? No, I, I also posed a stupid question at the beginning. That's all what I wanted to say. In, in I mean, in addition to reinviting uh, Litya, I, I think she is completely sure that we are we will very much appreciate her presence in, in, in our center. So I would like also to add uh, that uh, Licia is a model, a role model for many young, uh, young people and especially for women uh, that uh, think that we are lacking in, in women in astronomy and especially in cosmology. There are uh, not so many. So that is, uh, I think that, uh, that uh, so I hope to see you again.
uh, working on also. Um, ask, I will ask you in the future about uh, this this matter to to present you as a role model for for the young generation. Thank, Thank you. you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Bye. My pleasure. Bye. -bye.